So there was a, uh, a Christian college back in the Midwest, Illinois, I think, and as it was larger than most Christian colleges, and as incoming freshmen would come, they would give them a survey, and they'd say, tell us about yourself, and through a series of questions and multiple choice, they got the freshman students got to express what they were like. And then, uh, a couple weeks into their studies, after they were over syllabus shock, anybody experience syllabus shock, you know what I'm talking about? So they kind of got into the rhythm of things. In one of their classes, they would have a similar survey, but they, the question this time is, what is God like? So the first, the first one is, what, is, what are you like? And then a couple weeks later, what is God like? And they would answer you know, their perceptions of God. And the professor who was kind of leading the charge on this, uh, he wrote a blog post a long time ago, uh, but he, the, what they found kind of consistently over a number of years is that the freshman students' perception of God was like 80, 90% the same as their perception of themselves. So what they were like is what they perceived God to be like. So if they were a happy-go-lucky person, what is God like? God's, God's happy and go-lucky. If, you know, if they were all about justice and fixing the world's wrongs, then what was God like? Well, he's all about justice and fixing the world's wrongs, right? And none of it would be wrong necessarily, but to perceive God the way you perceive yourself, it's inter interesting, isn't it? We, we are people who are made in the image of God, but like we've been talking about, it's so easy to actually recreate God or try to in the image of yourself. And what we need to realize is how easy it is to have a distorted view of God, I mean, if God is 90% like you, is that a good thing? I, I don't know. We can talk about, that, talk about that later. We are made in the image of God, but it is a mistake for us to try and create him in, in our image because he, while we are, to, we are created in his image to become like him, in fact, the end of Romans, right? The agenda that God has for us is to recreate us into the very image of Jesus but the reverse is not true for us to try and make God into our image and be like what we're like. And I think of Isaiah 55. You remember this? Have you heard this verse? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, where through Isaiah, God's saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways, your ways, declares the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we should actually take a lot of comfort in this, shouldn't we? The God of the Bible, his, uh, he has created us in his image, but he is not like us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As we approach the scripture then, we always approach it with awe and wonder about this great God who created the heavens and the earth and what he is telling us about himself. And in this study, uh, in this series, What is a Name? We're, we're looking at what God has told us about himself. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna assume, we don't wanna make him into our image, we don't wanna have a distorted view of God, we actually wanna go to the source, an authoritative source, God himself, when he talks about what he is like. And this is in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 34. Verses just verse six and seven. This is our launch point for the whole series, where God is, you know, with Moses. Moses has broken those tablets. God tells him to make a couple new tablets, and then God passes in front of Moses, and He speaks these words: "The uh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness." maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is what God says about himself. This is who he is. And this passage, this, this paragraph is repeated often in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament. If you're reading along in the Life Journal readings with us, uh, just this past week, we, you know, we read out of Psalm 86, and verse 15, as I read it, it's like, doing, 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 because David actually quotes Exodus 34 in the midst of Psalm 86, but you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. 
Where did David get that? He's plagiarizing. Because it's verbatim. And there's throughout the scripture, why would, you, why would you quote those? Because God is telling us about himself. So in, in the series, we're only three weeks in, but where have we been? Uh, we've, a couple weeks ago, Marcus shared with us, you know, the, the name, the Lord, the Lord, you know, the, the name. Who should I say sent me to you? The, say the Lord, Yahweh has sent you. And he is one who is present. He is the I am. He is forever present. The way I think about it is God in the creation account actually created time. You and I live in time. God Almighty does not live in time. He lives outside of time. He created time. The sun, the moon, and the stars, the seasons, it's all a part of his creation. He is above and sovereign over all of that. That's why when we try to figure out, does God know the end from the... Yes, he knows it all because he lives outside of time. That is hard for us, I know, because we are time-bound uh, by his design. You know, we count season and years, and none of us are getting younger, right? I mean, it's like birthdays come more frequently all the time. Can we slow that train down? No. He lives outside of that. He is forever present. He is I am. You don't have to wonder if God is around for you today. And to live a life that reflects him and brings him glory, it's appropriate because of who he is. He is here. He is everywhere. And then last week we talked about him being Compassionate and grace, gracious, right? The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. And if you weren't here just to catch you up, it's interesting and significant that he leads with these. To be merciful or, or compassionate um, is this feeling. He has, he has feelings for us. God is saying, I'm compassionate. I feel for you, Right? Uh, like a mother and a child. That's the feeling, that's the imagery, just this love and compassion for you. And gracious, meaning I am for you. So God is a compassionate and gracious God. He, he is in love with us. He feels emotion for you. And he is for you, which, you know, in our study of Romans 8, several weeks ago, it makes sense, right? Romans 8, 28, we know that God, right, we know that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Why? Because God is for you. He is rooting for you. He has compassion for you. He is working in your life to bring about the good as he makes you and me into the image of Jesus. Now, the cross of Jesus, him dying on that Roman cross, is the ultimate, isn't it? It's the ultimate in God saying, I am for you. I am for you. I am paving a way for you to be in relationship with me. So God is describing his character, and he is consistent, and yet he is complex. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. We need to approach him with awe and wonder and worship because of who he is. Do you agree? That's who, what we should do. And the more we come to know him, we can come to know him. Right? The more worship will come from us as we uh, just are so in awe of him. Last week I was listening to Marcus and taking notes. I encourage you guys to take notes. You know, uh, even in the, if you don't have a little journal like I do here, taking notes on sermons. And uh, in the weekly, you know, on the backside of the weekly this week, there's a place to scribble notes. Not because the preachers say awesome things all the time, usually not, but the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart in moments like these. And where was that verse? I can't remember. Psalm 86, 15. You write down that, and then later, right? It's like, what was that? Because God is for you. He's, this is a relationship. So I encourage you to take notes when you're environment, in an environment like this. And I was doing that last week, and uh, Marcus was preaching on how we are, we are image bear, bear, uh, bearers. Right? We, we are created in the image of God, and we carry, we bear the image of God. And I wrote that down. We are image bearers. And then a couple minutes later, I went back 
to write my next thing that he was saying. I looked at that, I said, we are image barriers. <laughs> We're what? I had written down, we are image barriers. So I crossed out barriers and I rewrote it, you know, no, no, we're image bearers. Man, if anybody knew that I did that, I could get fired. This is like, and then I began to think, isn't it true? Sometimes we are image barriers. And um, people are looking for God and we claim to walk with him and know him and the image that they're seeing or feeling from us even, are we image barriers? We're image bearers. So we approach the scripture and we approach God with, you know, teach us how to be more like you, Lord. We want to rightfully bear your image and not be a hindrance or an obstacle for anybody. And as a church, we want to be a doorway for people to come to know this great God and Savior who is perfectly represented in the person of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior who laid down his life so that we could be in relationship with God and to know him as our heavenly father, to not be a barrier for anybody to see that, to learn that, to come towards him. When you really want to do, have a life like that, then all the things that we nitpick about and we're just like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Yes, it's all wrong. Society that we're living in, I mean, you, I mean just close your eyes and point. You, all of it's wrong without God. Let's just embrace it's all wrong without God. And what we do is say, but with Jesus, the wrong is made right. And lives are restored and marriages are healed and families are taken care of and children are nurtured when Jesus is Lord of all. So not to be a barrier for that, but to demonstrate Jesus to the world and allow people to be where they're at because they have a story too. And this great God loves them. I hope you agree. Today, we're gonna look at the next phrase, right? Uh, which is slow to anger. So God says to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. It's actually a question out there, do you think? Is God angry? Is God an angry God? It would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? If God was in heaven and among us even now and just angry, there is so much opposed to his goodness and his glory. If God were angry, many of us would be like, For, of course he is. And a lot of people walk around their days with just the, it's kind of the default understanding that God is angry. It's actually, there's a kind of a continuum here between God is always angry and God is always, what do you think, always tolerant. And people, you know, there's people in that God's angry. I mean, look at the world today. Hell in a handbasket, right? I mean, it's going. God's, you know, and, and then the other end of the spectrum is God is always tolerant. I mean, God is love and anything goes. And, and it's like the spectrum, and what's interesting is that people actually reject the idea of God on both of the extremes. Because if God is always angry, I'm scared. And I don't want to have anything to do with an angry God. I mean, I just can't. I can't go there. But even always tolerant, that seems more appealing. But there are people who say, if God is always tolerant, no thank you. I've experienced, and loved ones of mine have experienced the cruelty and the sin of this world. And if God is just tolerant of that, well, I don't, I don't have any use for him either. There's a spectrum, you know, so where would you might be? You know, what's the answer? Is God always angry or is God always tolerant? The answer is neither. Letter C, I guess, neither. God is not always angry, and he's not always tolerant. God is neither. God is not always angry. What does the scripture say? He is slow to anger, which means he, can, he becomes angry. It's an emotion that he has. Our God has all the emotions. That's one of the ways that we're created in his image with the ability to think and to feel, to feel emotion. He's given us these to reason and to choose, 
But he is an emotional guy. He does get angry, but he is slow to angry, slow to anger. Uh, I heard a pastor <laughs> uh, last year sometime, he was talking about this, and he put it this way. He says, you can make God angry, but you really have to work at it. It's not that he never gets angry. Oh, God's just always loving. All no, no. He can become angry, but you really have to work at it. And he's not always angry. He's not always angry at all. So we don't want to put up barriers, and we don't want to throw in the towel on the extremes. We, must, we want to understand who this God is. He is slow to anger. He can become angry on things that are opposed to his goodness and his righteousness, but he is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger. Often a question is, if God is love, why would he ever become angry? And the idea of God's wrath, I mean, the question, can, can wrath come from a loving God? I mean, really? That's a, that's a common question. Maybe you are having that question even now as you're thinking about this. And usually what happens is we're just thinking about it through our own filter. I mean, for many of us, there were times growing up where our parents were angry, and in those moments of anger, they were not loving. And even for us, if you have children, I mean, I'll confess, there are you know, moments where my anger resulted in not very loving. And yet, God is not like me. He is more than able to be angry and loving at the same time. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And there's actually a strong connection between love and anger. There are times where the appropriate loving response is anger. And he's able to do this perfectly. Um, the, the opposite of love, you see, is not anger. We kind of think that. God's loving, so he can't be, no, no. Um, I don't know where I picked this up either, but I think it's true. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is indifference, where I just, I don't care. Do what you want, <laughs> you know? So we have a God who is slow to anger, but he is never indifferent. He always cares. He is compassionate. He feels, and he is gracious. He is for us. And he, may, he is slow to anger, but he is not indifferent because he loves for us. Now, what about God's wrath? You know, God's wrath often happens. In fact, we saw it in Romans chapter 1 when we studied Romans 1. We see God's wrath coming when he, not out of indifference, but finally giving people what they want. When human beings want what they want, and, they, and we don't want to live for God. We don't want to glorify him. We want what we want when we want it. At, at some point, God, this is what Romans 1, we see it in Romans 1, God gives us over to what we want. You don't want to live with me and for me and for my glory? I am Yahweh. Then he gives them over. We see it in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. God gave them over, and wrath comes as people experience the consequences, the consequences of what they really want that's not God. Verse 24, so verse 26, the same. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. God gives, them, gives us over to what we want that's not him, and that's wrath. You experience life without God. Also verse 28 Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, see this, that's really important. Not pursuing God, the knowledge of God. They didn't want to keep that, retain that. So, because of that, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And you might think, well, God giving them over, he just, as if God's, you know, that giving them over is indifference. See, God's not loving. He's indifferent to them. He just gives them over to a depraved mind. No, no. The whole letter of Romans is telling us what? God is not indifferent. In spite of our sin, in spite of our depraved minds, he is paving a way for us to be in relationship with him through Jesus. 
He is not indifferent at all. And the cross of Jesus communicates, you know, uh, God demonstrates his own love, right? Romans Roman 6, 23. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He is not indifferent. He is pursuing us. And although we sin and sin against him, he is compassionate. He feels emotion for us. He cares for us. And he is for us. He wants the best thing for us. Sometimes the best thing for us when we are so rebellious is to hand us over that we experience the consequences of our sin so that what? We can come to our senses and repent and pursue him like we ought to. God is slow to anger. I love how Peter wrote it in 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Peter writes, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the, Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is, say it with me, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God is slow to anger. He is patient with us because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants us to repent from way, living lives without him. So if you're in a place where you feel like, man, I am experiencing the consequences of my choices and not pursuing Jesus, God's handing me, I'm experienced, you know, all that. Is it hopeless? What do you do? No, no, repentance is what is offered. God is slow to anger. He is, he is patient with us, wanting no one to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's what Acts 2, right? Acts 2 says. People were pierced to the heart, and they said, what do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God is slow to anger. Do you see how quick he is for redemption and restoration? There were 3,000 people that day who repented and were baptized into Christ. And what did God do for them that day? He forgave their sins, and he gave them the gift of his presence, his very Holy Spirit. He is slow to anger, but he is quick to love and forgive. Do you see it? He is quick to restore. Why? Because he feels for you. He is for you. He wants you to be in this relationship with him because it's what's best for you and me. You might be in that place, you know, that place of wrath even. I've made bad choices. Life is dust. Is it too late for me? Some people will say it's too late for me, right? He's probably too angry toward me to forgive me of my sin. Is it too late for me? I've probably made, committed the unforgivable sin. Listen, it is not too late for you. It is not too late for you. And if you are asking the question, have I committed the unforgivable sin, that sin that cannot be forgiven? You know, the scripture talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit this unforgivable sin. If you are asking the question, have I committed the unforgivable sin? Is it too late for me? If you're asking that question, you haven't done it. The people who have committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit are not asking that question. They're not asking, have I gone, have I gone too far? Am I beyond the reach of God? They're not asking that. Their hearts and their consciences have been seared they don't even think that or care about that. There's nothing there. If you're asking the question, no, it's not too late for you at all. I'm glad you're asking that question. Let's talk about who God is. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. You can walk with him today. You can walk with him. When I think about Jesus and you know all that he was and is and what he taught and what he did. So I'm thinking about, you know, Luke 15 came to my mind. You know, what, what's the teaching of Jesus that best reflects God being slow to anger, merciful and 
compassionate, gracious to us. In Luke 15, you know, there's the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, and then there's this parable of the lost son. And in the parable of the lost son, there were two sons, and the younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. And for the first century Jewish mind, when they heard Jesus say this, basically what the young son was saying was, dad, I kind of wish you were dead. Can you just speed up the process and go ahead and give me my share of the inheritance? And what's amazing is that the father did it. And after a little bit of time, the young son gathered up all of his belongings and he went off to a distant land where Jesus said he spent, uh, he squandered his wealth in wild living. And then life happens, right? And there was a famine in the land and he was out of money. The friends that he purchased were gone. They weren't around. He hires himself out to uh, someone who owned pigs and his job was to feed the pigs. Now, you, <laughs> a Jewish young man feeding pigs and if you, you know, pigs were like anathema. I mean, it's like you don't, I mean, they were everything opposed to their religion as a Jew. And here he is feeding the pigs. And it got worse. He actually saw the slop and it's like, I, I could eat this. Life happened to him. And when he came to his senses, and this is where we see repentance, right? Verse 17. We see repentance here because the, he says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set, back, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Even physically, this is a, a, a picture of repentance. You know, if you're living your life apart from God, you're the Lord, you're the decision maker, and you come to your senses, repentance is turning around saying, I'm wrong, I need God. And the young man, I mean, he repented, and he, I will go back to my father. And he had this speech that was all true. And it says, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. God is a compassionate and gracious God. And this father he did not become angry when the son wished he was dead. He didn't become angry when the son gathered up all of the wealth and left. And now that he sees his son, he wasn't angry at his appearance. There were no grudges held. There was compassion and grace. To, the, he ran to him. And he threw his arms around him. Why? Because he is his father and he felt for him. And he was for him. And the son, right, he launches in, verse 21, he launches into this prepared speech, and the dad cuts him off. He doesn't even let him finish. And he turns to the servant, and he says, verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. He's compassionate, slow to anger. It's all right here in this story Jesus told. They began to celebrate. Why? He, he cuts him off, says, hey, go get a robe, sandals, put a ring on his finger, because he was, he, he was his son. He was never not his son. And although he smelled to high heaven, I mean, pig slop and all the rest, he he restored him. And what did he restore his son to? He restored his identity. He reminded him of who he, who he was. He gave him position and identity as his son. He was not angry. He loved him. And they celebrated. They threw a party. He was dead, but now he's alive. He's lost. Now he's found. 
listen, if you, you might be concerned, like I've gone too far, I've done too much, I can't. As soon as you turn your heart towards your Father in heaven, here's what you can expect. Compassion and grace. He is slow to anger. You, he can become angry, but you have to work really hard to get it. And even if you have, there is forgiveness available as you repent. Come to your senses. Allow life to teach its lessons like I've tried other things in life and it all pales in comparison to living for Jesus. None of it satisfies the deepest parts of our soul. None of it. And rejoice. Allow yourself to rejoice in who you are in Christ. Psalm 30 this, is, this should be us, Psalm 34 and 5. Sing the praises of the Lord, all you faithful people. Praise his holy name. Why? For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor, his grace, his presence lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. I want to give you a few moments of prayer. Time, just put your things down, put your pens down, and just let's, let's approach this compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, loving Father. Just seek him in prayer just now. And if you're hesitating, if you're hesitating to turn your heart towards God, just say, just say, Lord, I'm, I'm turning my heart towards you. And find in him a compassionate and gracious Heavenly Father. Let's pray. As we go into a time of communion where we eat this bread and drink the cup to remember what Jesus has done for us, think about that son. Minutes later, he's sitting at a table with his father and there's all this food now. There's all this celebration. He's been forgiven. He's looking at his father. He was hungry, but do you think he could even eat? His heart was full. I mean, his, the reception from his father. As so we remember what Jesus has done for us, this, this is a table too, isn't it? We get to, we've been invited to this table and it, our Father is gracious and compassionate. There's forgiveness readily available. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive us of every sin as we confess that and repent. But just dwell in his presence as you eat and drink and remember that he is for you and he's paved the way for you and me. Let's, with great appreciation and worship, Let's eat 
and drink and remember what God has done for us in Jesus.